First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 4 is full preterism of a damnable heresy part 10. Today we're going to wrap it up, although I'll deal with uh, the resurrection of the body at another time. We're, dealing, we're going to deal solely with arguments of full preterists and refute specific arguments that they use all the time that are very common. I, I dealt with one last week where they appeal to Luke. And uh, so we're going to be refuting those, and I think you'll find this very helpful. And I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. And I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Okay, falling asleep obviously refers to death, physical death. For we, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, that is, dead. <clears throat> For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those are people in graves, dead people. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What the full preterist does, and he goes, oh, they use the word we. So the second coming had to happen while they were still alive. The word we is used in the New Testament talking about the spiritual, uh, the invisible church and all sorts of things. It's the same argument for, that the... Uh, People who deny justification, the uh, Doug Wilson and those fellows used to argue that uh, election, everybody in the church, in the, in, the, in the professed church is elect because they've been baptized. Nonsense. Anyway, we come to our second argument. These are arguments by full preterists. Another common argument is that Jesus and the apostles clearly expected an imminent coming of the Lord. Therefore, if one does not accept the full preterist position then one could fall prey to the modernist argument that Christ and his disciples expected a near coming, but they were obviously wrong. And that's, that, is, that part's true. Liberals say that all the time. Oh yeah, they expected Christ to return in their lifetime, but it didn't happen. Because the Bible's not inspired, the Bible's not infallible, and the Bible's full of mistakes. Uh, modernists are totally wrong, and so are full preterists. In addition... The Bible teaches only two comings of Christ, not three. While modernists are correct in pointing out that there were inspired expectations of an imminent or near coming of Christ, and it is true that the imminent passages or time indicators have often been overlooked, ignored, and not treated seriously by most evangelicals, that's why Gary DeMar's book, which I believe came out in the 80s or 90s, probably the late 80s, was so popular because it dealt with a need in the church. This observation would only prove the full preterist position if, if the Bible did not make a clear distinction between a coming and judgment in history and our Lord's literal bodily coming at the end of history. Not the end of the Jewish age, or the, the, not the end of the Jews as the people of God, as God's visible church, but the end of the, the world. Well, there are only two literal bodily comings of Christ. There are many comings in judgment, many. AD 70 was one. The destruction of Rome was another. The fall of Adolf Hitler in Germany was another. The fall of the Soviet Empire was another. There are many judgments in history. And Christ is in charge of all these judgments. Read Psalm 2. Read Psalm 110. Jesus coming against Israel and Jerusalem in the three and a half years of the war with Rome that ended in AD 70 did not involve a literal or bodily coming of Christ at all. It was a sign that the theanthropic mediator was sitting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Matthew 24, 30. If one studies scripture carefully and uses standard Protestant sound principles of interpretation, it is not hard to see that the New Testament makes a distinction between Jesus coming in judgment on apostate Israel and his bodily coming to judge all men who ever lived. 
and we've covered this many, many times, and we'll cover it again today. There's just no way in the world you can take these passages about a literal bodily resurrection, which are abundant, and passages about a literal descent of Christ from heaven in his body, like Acts 1, 9 to 11. You can't get around those passages. They're there. You can't. Now, they try to reinterpret them out of existence, and I've talked, you know, I used to talk to these guys on the internet many, many years ago, like 20 years ago. And their arguments are absolutely ridiculous. The full preterist refuses to see the obvious scriptural evidence because he is blinded by his presuppositions. The Millennium of Revelation 20, which describes the period between the resurrection of Christ and his bodily return to judge all humanity and the demons, is clearly described as a very, very long period of time. The 1,000 years is a symbol of a vast period of time, not 40 years. Here's David Shelton. Satan is to remain bound, John tells us, for a thousand years, a large rounded off number. As we have seen that the number seven connotes fullness of quality in biblical imagery, the number ten indicates the, the fullness of quantity. In other words, it stands for manyness. A thousand multiplies and intensifies this ten times ten times ten in order to express great vastness. And then he gives about ten different examples from scripture. Thus God claims to own the cattle on a thousand hills, Psalm 50, verse 10. This, of course, does not mean that the cattle on the thousand and first hill belongs to someone else. God owns all the cattle on all the hills. But he says a thousand to indicate that there are many hills and much cattle. And then he gives a number, several examples. Similarly, the thousand years of Revelation 20 represent a vast, undefined period of time. It has already, already lasted almost 2,000 years and will probably go on for many more. And here's... Philip Edgecombe Hughes, who's an excellent scholar, quote, the thousand years may be defined as the period between the two comings of Christ or more strictly between the return of the ascended son to glory, his mission to earth completed, and the loosing of Satan for a little while, verse 3. Uh, the latter, however, is the final event in this period, and it ends, as we have seen, in the conclusive defeat of Satan and his host of Christ's second coming. This is the perspective clearly delineated in the assertion of Hebrews 10.20 and following, that when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down and throned at the right hand of God, then to wait until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. See Psalm 110, verse 1. And this is precisely what Paul affirms when he writes that he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15, 25. End of quote. Now, the reason I quote that, in the full preterist system, his enemies are not put under his feet. There's a progressive defeat of them in history, but it's never completed. Number three, and I think this is their best argument. This is their most clever argument. A very clever argument used by full preterists is a comparison between Jesus' discourse in Luke 17 and Matthew 24, demonstrating that our Lord used identical terminology from after Matthew 24, 35 and following to describe his coming in Luke 17, 20 to 37. The point of this comparison is to prove that Luke's account plays as things noted after Matthew 24, 35, out of order. Okay, remember, that's the dividing line that, that Ken Gentry and Greg Bonson and Matthew Henry and many, many commentators think is the dividing line of the chapter. There's a few exceptions. John Gill says the dividing line is the end of chapter 24. Uh, toward the end of chapter 24, and then that begins a new subject. But most divided at verse 35. Matthew's events are described in a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 order, while Luke's are 2, 4, 1, 5 order, 3 order. This is supposed to be very significant because partial preterists interpret Matthew 24, 35, most of them, as the end of the discussion of the destruction of Jerusalem, while 24, 36 begins a new teaching regarding the second bodily coming. It's a very common view. It's a majority view of commentators. For example, Kenneth L. Gentry Jr. writes this. But what does he so dogmatically and carefully tell them? Whatever the difficult apocalyptic imagery in some of the preceding verses, for example, verses 29 to 31, may indicate, Jesus clearly says that all these things will occur before this generation passes away. He employs the near demonstrative for the fulfillment of verses 2 to 34. These events will come upon this generation. 
He uses the far demonstrative in 2436 to point to the second advent, that day. And grammatically what he says is correct. The coming tribulation, 2421, see Revelation 1-9, was to come upon this generation. 2336, 2434. See 1 Thessalonians 2.16. And was to be foreshadowed by certain signs. Matthew 24, 4-8. But the second advent was to be at that far day and hour and was not to be preceded by particular signs of its nearness. For no one can know it. 24.36. Matthew 24.36. Preterism well, is well established in Matthew 24.3-34. As many early church fathers recognized. End of quote. And... Uh, Gentry's excellent. I think he's better than David Shelton. David Shelton is infected with uh, interpretive maximalism and sacramentalism from, David, from uh, James Jordan. So Chilton is generally good, but Chilton says a lot of stupid things in his commentary in Revelation about using incense and, and baptismal regeneration. Uh, as where Ken Gentry is much more dependable, and he's actually a better Greek scholar. He, he really is good at exegesis. <clears throat> now there is no question that Luke 17 does use warnings that are identical to warnings both before and after, uh, both, uh, both before, found both before and after Matthew 24, 24 to 35, which is Gentry and many others dividing line, including Matthew Henry. <coughs> and let me just show you the comparisons. Here's Matthew 24, 17, let him who was on the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house. Matthew, uh, that's Matthew 24, 4, 17, Luke 17, 31. And that day he was on the housetop and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take them away. Matthew 24, 3, 23. Then if anyone says to you, look here, there's the Christ or there, do not believe it. Uh, Luke 17, 23. And, and they say to you, look here, or look there, do not go after them or follow them. Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning comes out of the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Luke 17, 24, for as a lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Uh, Matthew 24, 28, for wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. <clears throat> That's referring to the slaughter of the Roman armies. Luke 17, 37, for wherever the body is, there the eagles shall be gathered. And then here's Matthew 24, 37 to 39, which is after verse 36. But as the day is of Noah, worse also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. According to Ken Gentry and many others, and I believe that's referring to the second coming. But here's a verse uh, in, in Luke 17. As was, was in the days of Noah, so also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. 41, two, uh, Matthew 24, 41, two men were in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Two women are grinding together, one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field, the one taken, the other left. Now, two things are affirmed in Luke 17. <clears throat> 26, 27, 35, and 36 are found in Matthew 24 after verse 35. Both affirm that the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the coming of the flood in the days of Noah, and both speak of men and women involved in daily, normal daily activities, laboring in a field, grinding wheat at the mill. So those are the things that they have in common. And that, according to a full preterist, proves you can't have a dividing line at verse 36. Now, does this observation prove that the second bodily coming of Christ described in the book of Acts and the epistles occurred by AD 70? And the answer is no, it certainly, most certainly does not prove that at all. It only proves their eschatological paradigm if one already accepts their presuppositions. Let us examine exegetical and theological reasons why their argument from Luke 17 simply does not work. And this is their best argument, and this is one of those things that convinced David Shelton to become a full preterist. First, the two things mentioned in Luke 17 that occur after Matthew 24, 35, people are involved in normally da daily work activities, economic activities, tilling and grinding. And number two, the people will be unprepared, like in the days of Noah, could both apply to the destruction of Jerusalem and the second bodily coming of Christ. 
See, what they've done is, this is called the fallacy of black and white. I should have wrote this in here. The fallacy of black and white is it either has to be this or it has to be that. It either has to teach full preterism or it teaches the orthodox position. Well, these, these things, these teachings could apply to both the judgment in AD 70 and the second coming. The fact that the descriptions of Jesus coming in judgment on Israel and Jerusalem are taken directly out of the Old Testament judgments, lightning, Zechariah 9.14, darkening of the sun, Isaiah 5.30, 8.22, 62.60.19, 60, Jeremiah 13.16, 23.12, Ezekiel 32.7-8, Amos 5.18.20, Zephaniah 2.15, Joel 2.2-10, 2, 2 and 10, C Acts 2.20, which quotes Joel, stars falling from the sky, Joel 2.10, Ezekiel 32.7, Isaiah 13.10, 34, 4 to 5, proves that the same or similar terminology can be used of different judgment events. And I should have mentioned this here, but let me just mention it now. Uh, that prophetic apocalyptic type terminology is used, it's, it's applied by, uh, in, in Acts by Peter to Pentecost. But it's, that identical language is also used of the second coming of Christ. So you can't say, well, it either has to apply to this or to that. It can apply to both. And it does. In judgments past, people were unprepared for Yahweh coming in judgment because they were focused on earthly things and did not place God or Jesus Christ first in their lives. People who reject the truth and live in sin do not expect judgment, and thus it comes upon them as a total surprise. And this is true of every judgment. The only people who are prepared for the coming of Jesus are Christians. Serious Christians who take it seriously. Everybody else is not prepared. And that's the point. Full preterists apparently think that it is impossible and totally improper for Jesus to use his prophecies regarding the destruction of Israel for unbelief and apostasy as an occasion to make some crucial applications regarding his second bodily coming to judge the whole world. And that's the standard Protestant interpretation of the passage. Remember, full preterism is something that came into being in the 1800s. It didn't exist in the church prior to that. Now, I know they, they, there are partial preterists throughout the Middle Ages, throughout in the early church, in the ancient church, even the Puritans. There are partial preterists. But full preterists will refer to partial preterists who sound just like Ken Gentry or, Dave, or, or Greg Bonson. And they'll appeal to them and say, see, preterism exists all the way back. We're just part of that orthodox line. No, full preterism is new. Partial preterism goes all the way back to the church fathers. Because it's obvious there's a switch sometime in, in Matthew 24 to the second coming. It's obvious, especially if you read chapter 25. In addition... Such applications are common and logical. That Luke 17 and Matthew 24, at least up to verse 35, are speaking of a temporal or historical judgment, not Jesus' second bodily coming, is proved by the comparison of Luke's account to Luke's abomination of desolation statement. Let me read this. Luke 17, 30 to 31. So it shall be in the, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, in that day he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take them away. <clears throat> here's, here's Matthew's version. Matthew 24, 15 to 17. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house. In other words, get out of town immediately or you're going to die. The Romans are going to come. This is your last opportunity to get out of town. And we know, I think it's Josephus who tells us, that they all fled to Pella and they escaped the destruction. In Matthew 24, Christians are to escape the city immediately when the abomination of desolation occurs. Since the revealing of the Son of Man in Luke 17 is not coterminous with the actual destruction of Jerusalem, it is clear that Jesus' coming in AD 70 was a coming in judgment, not a literal bodily coming, attended by a general resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, and the beginning of the final or consummate state. The 
get out of town. The abomination, you saw the abomination of desolation, and how, however you interpret that. Some interpret that as the Romans uh, going into the Holy of Holies and sacrificing a pig. Uh, some interpret it as just the Romans' presence with their idols. They had idols on their, they carried idols with them in their army. There's different views. But clearly it's connected to Daniel, and it's something that occurred before AD 70. Now, a number of scholars, Plummer, Alford, Lenski, Manson, Hendrickson, Stein, Marshall, apply Luke 17 solely to the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> but such a view is unnecessary once we understand the distinction between coming in a historical judgment and the final coming that ushers in the final consummate state. And this is what gets me about full preterism. The Bible speaks of several comings. You know, this, it's got to be this, or it's got, it's got to be the second coming, or it's not accurate at all. That's just ignorant of Scripture. There are several comings of Yahweh in judgment in the Old Testament. Genesis 11, 5-7, the Tower of Babel incident, the coming down to deliver Israel from the Egyptians, and it says coming down, Exodus 3, 8, the coming to give the moral law, Exodus 19, 9, 34, 5, the coming in judgment, spoken of in Psalm 18, 7 to 15, verse 9. He bowed the heavens and came down. He came down. The coming in judgment upon Egypt, Isaiah 19, 1 and following. A coming down to defend Mount Zion, Isaiah 31, 4 to 5. A coming down, I'm using the language of the Hebrew. A coming down to judge Israel, Micah 1, 3 and following. A coming of the Messiah to judge the wicked of Israel, Malachi 3, 5. Given the overwhelming biblical evidence that there are many examples of comings in judgment, and it uses the terminology of coming, even the coming on the clouds, there is no exegetical reason to confuse Jesus' coming in judgment to prove that he is at God's right hand, Matthew 24, 30, with a second bodily, literal coming to judge all mankind and usher in the final state which is coterminous, virtually, with the resurrection of physical bodies and the rapture of living saints to meet Jesus in the air. And then the final judgment and then the beginning of the final state. They have to define all that away because it doesn't fit their paradigm. But if there's many comings in judgment throughout the whole Bible, why do you have to insist that this coming in judgment on Israel is the second coming, bodily coming? Of course, they don't believe in a bodily coming. They deny it. They have to deny it because it didn't happen. Second, we come once again to the crucial matter of proper biblical interpretation. <clears throat> Should we interpret the scene of Christ sitting in judgment over the nations in the Gospel of Matthew to harmonize with clear didactic passages in the epistles that describe the second and final judgment? Or should we take a coming in judgment passage in Matthew 24 that uses highly symbolic Old Testament language regarding temporal judgments. Temporal judgments. And then we've discussed this before. This expression, if you look at, get, get a strong exhaustive concordance, look up the day of the Lord. It's found throughout the Old Testament. The coming day, or that day. The day. These are days of judgment. And there's many of them. But they all point to the final judgment which is the day, or that day, in capital letters. <clears throat> so we don't want to use symbolic language to reinterpret all the clear didactic passages in the epistles. The epistles are didactic. They're teaching, explaining. The Gospels are primarily history. They, can't, they contain very crucial teaching as well. But the, the epistles explain the person and work of Christ more fully. You don't use an obscure didactic section in Matthew 24 to reinterpret the whole, all the epistles, which are clear didactic teaching, which tell us that Christ is coming back literally, bodily, to judge the living and the dead. There's a very good reason why biblical scholars and theologians throughout the ages have rejected full preterism. It is explicitly contradicted by, by the inspired discussions of what is involved in the second bodily coming of Christ throughout the New Testament. Full preterists essentially do what all the cults do.
they had adopt an interpretation regarding Jesus' discussion of the destruction of Jerusalem, saying it encompasses everything said throughout the whole New Testament about our Lord's return, and then reinterpret all the clear didactic descriptions about the second coming to fit their system. And I, you know, I, I would, it was like 20 years ago, I would debate these guys on the internet. And, um, The part about the rapture, they said that's just a spiritual experience. It doesn't mean what it says. They take everything and it becomes either regeneration or a spiritual experience or some spiritual experience or a secret judgment or in Acts, uh, Acts uh, 1, 9 to 11, which explicitly tells us as he ascended in his body, he's going to descend. They go, see, it says the word cloud. That means it refers to Matthew 24 because it has the word cloud. I mean, their arguments are idiotic. Consequently, when we are told that Jesus will return in his resurrected body just as he, as he arose, Acts 1, 9 to 11, they deny it. When Jesus, Matthew 5, 29 to 30, 10, 28, John 11, 25, etc., and Paul teach that there will be a literal bodily resurrection of people out of their graves, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 54, it's explicit. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 to 16, it's explicit. We just read it. They reject it. Passages speak about an actual defeat of death. First, First Corinthians fifteen fifty four, Revelation twenty four four, and a complete removal of the curse of the effects of the fall on planet Earth are all reinterpreted and thus rejected. The analogy of Scripture renders the full preterist position impossible. That's why it's been rejected by all the creeds and confessions throughout history. It cannot be. Uh, lined up with what the epistles teach. You just can't. And then third, and here we're going to get into Matthew 24 some, so you'll find this interesting. The majority view of Christian scholars that Matthew 24, 36 is a transitional verse to the second bodily coming of Christ actually has some really good exegetical arguments behind it. It's not some arbitrary view. It's, it's got some good arguments. There are a number of reasons why most Christian scholars regard verse, verse 36 as a dividing line between two related yet distinct subjects, different subjects. First, verses 40, 34 to 35 have all the characteristics of a concluding statement to the preceding prophecy. Further, the grammatical construction of verse 36 definitely indicates a new subject. The but of or but concerning phrase is used when a speaker or writer wants to change a subject. That's extremely common. Those who do not regard verse 36 as a transition to a second bodily coming could argue that while there is no question that a transition occurs in verse 36, it is not a transition to the second bodily coming, but to the necessity of being ready or prepared for the coming discussion in the previous section. The, the coming discussed in the previous section. I just don't think that's a good argument, especially when you look at Matthew 25. And uh, did Jesus sit on his throne and divide the sheep from the goats publicly and have a public judgment of all the nations in Matthew 24? Did that occur in AD 70? Well, if you assert that, you've got to assert it happened secretly and nobody knows about it, but it must have happened. Then you, you, get, into, you get into start interpreting scripture like a Jehovah's Witness. Second, in verse 36, we noted this from Gentry's quote, a change of subject matter is indicated by the use of the far demonstrative that, as in that day. From 23, 36 to 24, 34, Jesus discusses events that will happen to this generation, the near demonstrative, this generation. However, in verse 36, he changes to the distant event with the use of the far demonstrative that day. Now, this argument is countered by full preterist, by the fact that the far demonstrative of that can be used of events only a few years away. Our Lord gave the Olivet Discourse 37 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, which is more than enough, in their view, to justify the use of that day. Some of the Lord's parables, however, Matthew 24, 48, 25, 5, and 19, and the 1,000-year millennium of Revelation 20 indicates a time period much longer than a single generation. So the that day in 
and we'll get into more why that day doesn't work with Matt, with the earlier part of Matthew 24, because he just gave us a bunch of signs to know exact, you know, about when it was going to happen. <laughs> As where the second coming, or our, we don't have signs for that. We only have general stuff. We'll see that in a moment. Third, the best argument for a change of the second bodily coming as in verse 36 and following, is a change of subject matter from an event that is very predictable to an event that is totally unpredictable. Throughout the Olivet Discourse, up to verse 34, Christ goes out of his way to make sure the disciples know when Jerusalem will be destroyed. He gave preliminary signs, Matthew 24, 5 to 8, the beginning of sorrows. Then he spoke of persecutions, verse 9, betrayal, verse 10, false prophets, verse 11, lawlessness, verse 12, and the spread of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire, verse 14. Then he gives very specific signs. The abomination of desolation, verse 15. And he warns them to get out of town. And we know from... Josephus, we know from the history of the war, there was a pause in the fighting and there was a period of time when they, there was a chance to escape. And we know from history that the Christians all left. You have to understand, Jews are not, not very many Jews are Christians today. But in that generation, there were a ton of churches in Jerusalem and there were a ton of Christians in Jerusalem. Some had already moved due to persecution. But there, were, there was a whole presbytery of Jerusalem. There was a ton of Christians after Pentecost. When the disciples see this specific sign, they are immediately to flee to the mountains to avoid destruction, which we know happened. That the disciples can know the close proximity of the Lord's coming of judgment is proved by Jesus' final warning. When you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Verse 33. Obviously, Christ knew the close proximity of his coming of judgment, and he prophetically gave this crucial information to the disciples so they can all get out of town. The emphasis of Matthew 24, 36 is on the fact, and following, is on the fact that no one knows the time of our Lord's coming. The angels and even the Son of Man does not know the critical moment of the Lord's arrival. Matthew 24, 36, Mark 13, 22. Indeed, the central proposition in the section after verse 36 is, Watch, therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. Matthew 24, 42, 25, 13. Christians are to watch, stay alert, remain awake because of the uncertainty of the time of the coming. And the central proposition is supported by five parables. The porter, Mark 13, 35 to 37, the master of the house, the faithful servant, and the evil servants, the ten virgins, the talents. And a description of the judgment that contains parabolic elements, the use of sheep and goats. Throughout the parables, there is an emphasis upon the fact that Jesus' coming will be a total surprise. People are going to be caught off guard, and many will not be prepared to meet the Lord. Men did not know until the floods came and took them away, verse 39. The master did not know what hour the thief would come, verse 43. The Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect, verse 44. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, at an hour of which he is not aware, verse 58. The bridegroom comes at an expected time, and the unprepared virgins are shut out of the wedding, 25.10. The parable of the porter adds this warning. This is from Mark 13, 35 to 36. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in the evening or at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly you be found sleeping. Now, all of this raises a crucial question. Can one apply the fact that the day of Jesus' coming is totally unexpected to the coming judgment upon Jerusalem in AD 70? Well, it appears to be very difficult, if not impossible, to apply these passages to the destruction of Jerusalem because Christ gives the disciples a number of signs. A heads-up alert. This, 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 and this is going to happen. And he gives them a super specific one, the abomination of desolation, where the Romans defile the temple. So they know. And we know historically... They all escaped. They got out of town. So that they could discern the coming judgment and avoid the devastation by fleeing to the mountains. This point has been used by a number of commentators and scholars to argue for a change of subject in verse 36. 
Note the following comments. Here's Matthew Henry. Verily I say unto you, you may take my word for it. These things are at the door. Christ often speaks of the nearness of that desolation, the more to affect people and quicken them for it. But as to that day and hour, which will, be a, which will put a period of time, that man no man knoweth, verse 36. Therefore take, the heed of, therefore take heed of confounding the two as they did. Spurgeon writes here, uh, there is a manifest change in our Lord's words here, which clearly indicates that they refer to his last coming in judgment. Lane, here's a modern commentator. <clears throat> Quote, in order to understand the relationship of this affirmation to the assurance given in verse 30 that the events preliminary to the destruction of the temple will occur within the experience of that generation, it is necessary to give full force to the adversative participle in verse 32. I say to you solemnly, this generation shall not pass. As for you, that day and that hour, on the contrary, no one knows. Well, the parable of the fig tree illustrates the possibility of observing the proximity of the first event. Another comparison is developed in connection with ver verse 33 that underscores the impossibility of the knowing the moment of our Lord's return. Verses 30 and 32 concern two distinct... I must have wrote the verses down wrong. Or I, oh, no, he's dealing with Luke. I'm sorry. He's dealing with the account in Luke. That's why the verses are different. He's not dealing with Mark. Lane is writing about the account in Luke. Verses 30 and 32 concern two distinct events the taking of Jerusalem by the Romans and the day of the Lord, respectively. See, it's a very common view, and it makes, much, it makes sense. And if you add Revelation, you add Daniel to the mix, uh, we know that the, that the Romans, it would take them uh, three and a half years for the destruction to take place. You're even given a very clear time indicator there. Now, those who believe that the destruction of Jerusalem theme continues through chapter 25 have a number of arguments that they use to attempt to circumvent the subjection. One argument is that the term hour is used figuratively to describe the season of this coming. In other words, we should view not view the term hour literally, but should understand it as speaking to the general overall calamity that came upon the Jews. The judgment event as a whole should come as a total surprise. Therefore, Christians must watch and remain alert. Here's Adam Clark, and he's not a full preterist, but here's what he says. The Greek word aura is translated season by many eminent critics and is used in this sense by both sacred and profane authors. As the day was not known in which Jerusalem would be invested by the Romans, therefore the Lord advises his disciples to pray that it might not be on the Sabbath, as the season was not known, and therefore they were to pray that it would not be in, might not be in winter, verse 20. End of quote. While this argument, on the surface, at first glance, may appear to be quite solid, <coughs> it has serious problems. First, if one interprets hora as season instead of day and then argues for a general period of time as Clark has done, then the Olivet Discourse has two separate comings of Christ. There would be a general coming before the abomination of desolation, Matthew 24, 15 to 22, and the specific coming that Jesus says will occur immediately after the tribulation of those days, Matthew 24, 29. The disciples will know that it is near at the doors when they see all these things, Matthew 24, 33. The phrase all these things obviously includes the abomination of desolation. Matthew 24, 20 applies to the flight connected to the abomination of desolation, not to the day and hour of Jesus' coming. Second, while the Greek word hora can mean a season in certain contexts, for example, John 5.35 or 2 Corinthians 7.8, it almost certainly does not mean season in the parabolic context of Matthew 24.37 and following. The emphasis on, in the parables is on a specific time, not a general season. Indeed, the word hora can refer to a definite point in time, for example, the hour is at hand, 26.45, literally, at the hour of dark, at the hour of incense, Matthew 1.10. That's the hour when they burn the incense. The hour Jesus rejoiced, Luke 10, 21, at the supper time, or literally at the hour of the supper, Luke 7, 14, 17, etc. If one substitutes the word season for hour in the parables of Matthew 24, 27 and following, one will see the absurdity of the season interpretation. Lastly, the season interpretation is conclusively disproved by the parable account, parallel account in Mark where evening, morning, the crow, and the rooster are specified, 1135b. In this passage, Mark refers to four night watches, which is a Roman method of reckoning time. 
the modern equivalent to Mark's modern equivalent to Mark's statement would be watch therefore for you do not know when the master is coming at 9 p.m. midnight that is 12 a.m. 6 a.m. or 9 a.m. 13:35 it is rather obvious that the term hour is used in the parables to denote the exact time of the lord's arrival okay so detailed when you're dealing with doctrine especially people that are this clever and manipulating scripture your exegesis has to be precise and very detailed. The best method for dealing with the argument that the coming cannot be, cannot be accompanied by many signs and still be a total surprise is the one which asserts that it is true that our Lord gave very specific signs to the disciples for the destruction of Jerusalem. Although he did, the exact day is not specified. Therefore, even though the disciples have a general idea as to when Jesus will come, they need to be extra alert in order to be prepared for the exact time of his arrival. Although one can understand how such an argument could be applied to a traditional understanding of the second bodily coming, it does not work well with the destruction of Jerusalem. The scenario simply does not make any sense. According to this view, the disciples have already observed the signs of Jesus' coming. They have witnessed the abomination of desolation. They've all fled to the mountains, the area of Pella, to avoid destruction. Yes, but they do not know the exact time when Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed. Therefore, they need to watch and be on the alert constantly for Jesus can come and demolish the city and sanctuary at any moment. It doesn't make sense. They're already out of the city. They're safe. What are they watching for? What's the point? It, see how absurd that is? The scenario raises the obvious question. If they already fled to safety in the mountains, which according to Josephus is exactly what happened, and are no longer in any danger of being harmed by the Roman armies encompassing Jerusalem, then why do they need to watch? They are already safe. The important event that the disciples must watch for in Matthew 24, 4-34 is not the day or the hour the city or temple went up in flames, but the abomination of desolation. And that's, I got Matthew 24, 15. I think that's wrong. It's 24, 15 or 24, 20. Another argument deals with the lack of signs by saying that Matthew 24, 36 and following, the topic changes from signs leading to the temple's destruction to watchfulness and expectation during the interim. If, by interim, one means the period of time between the Olivet Discourse and the appearance of the signs, then one has adopted a, a position that contradicts the explicit teaching of the parables in Matthew 24, 36 and following where believers are told not to look for signs, but for Christ's arrival. Further, if the disciples are just being told that they must be ready for the calamity that is to come upon the land of Israel, then the repeated emphasis on the day and the hour, the exact time of Jesus' coming, seems totally out of place. Remember, the, the second coming of Christ is an event that happens in a moment of time, on a particular day. Now, if by interim one means the period of time between the appearance of the signs and the exact time of Jesus' coming, then one must still answer the question, why is watchfulness for the exact time of our Lord's arrival, the destruction of the city and temple, a critical issue when all the believers are already safe and secure in the mountains? While it is obvious why such watchfulness is needed for a second bodily coming, which is accompanied by the general resurrection and the last judgment, there is no need for Christians who are already safe at Pella totally safe, totally away from Jerusalem, to be concerned about the exact time the temple is to go up in flames. What's the point? But if you look at the epistles and you see the second bodily coming, where there's a resurrection of all men, there's the rapture, and there's a, a final judgment, you can see that these parables make absolute sense. Only Christ's enemies, the unbelieving Jews, who were guilty of persecuting Christians, were slaughtered by the Romans on the day the city and the sanctuary were destroyed. For Christians, life went on, while their Jewish persecutors were crushed and subdued. So this, this turning everything into the second coming does not make sense, exegetically or logically, and it certainly contradicts the epistles, as we noted. Interpreters who argue for a change at verse 36 often point out that the analogy between the life in the days of Noah and life in Israel prior to the day of Jesus' coming does not work. The comparison between the flood event and the coming of Christ in Matthew 24, 31 is twofold. 
the people are completely taken by surprise by the flood, and they did not know until the flood came and took them away. Matthew 24, 39. Two, the people in Noah's day were living a normal lifestyle. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Matthew 24, 38. These two points are intimately related. Because people are completely unaware that the flood event is almost upon them, they live life as though nothing unusual is going to happen. In other words, there were no signs preceding the flood, and thus the people followed their ordinary pursuits until the day of the flood swept them away. Now, one could say that that's just a general warning against worldliness. Uh, people are living their life without any concern for Christ, and that, that which does make sense, and you do find that passage in Luke 17. <clears throat> Another common argument for a transition to verse 36 is that the parables indicate themselves. They indicate a long delay in Christ's coming, which is inconsistent with the teaching of the parable of the fig tree, Matthew 24, 32 to 33, as well as the statement, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place, Matthew 24, 34. Here's Matthew 24, 48. But if that, but if that evil servant says, says in his head, my master is delaying his coming, Here's 25.5. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. After Here's another one. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and sub settled accounts with them. Matthew 25.19. Expositors who connect all of chapter 24 and 25, the destruction of Jerusalem, argue that 37 years between the time that Jesus uttered these words and the Jewish war are more than enough ad or adequate to account for the terminology of a long delay. They also appeal to 2 Peter 3.14 which they believe indicates that within one generation, scoffers will be asking, where is the promise of his coming? Those who believe in a long delay will counter by arguing that all the parables presuppose the absence of signs. In other words, how could that first generation of Christians say that the Lord was delaying his coming when there were preliminary signs as well as very specific signs of his coming in judgment? Also, the view that this long delay applies to 37 years contradicts Jesus' statement that the disciples would see the signs and know that the event was at the door. Further, the parables do not speak of Jesus coming to judge Jerusalem, a city of apostate unbelievers, but of coming to judge and evaluate faithful believers and hypocritical professors of Christianity at an unknown time. The judgment of Matthew 25 uh, does not fit with Matthew 24 at all unless one holds that there was a secret judgment that nobody knows about. And it only applies to people that had, been, that had lived and died at that time. People on earth certainly weren't judged by Christ at that time. They did not know of a judgment. There was not a separation of the sheep or the uh, of goats publicly at a final judgment at that time. So that, that's a problem as well. Just showing you there's serious problems with trying to say that everything fits into the first century paradigm. If we take the day literally, does this analogy apply to the period of time immediately prior to the destruction of Jerusalem? Were the inhabitants of Jerusalem taken by surprise by the destruction of their city by the Romans? No. Jerusalem was under siege for months. The Roman armies had destroyed Jewish cities before they reached Jerusalem. One could say that the beginning of the war was a surprise. Remember, the war lasted three and a half years. But the outcome was not. Further, as noted... The destruction of the city and sanctuary was preceded by many, many signs. Thus, it was a very predictable event. Also, were the people of Judea and Jerusalem living normal lives until the day the temple went up in flames? And the answer is no. The Jewish war lasted three and a half years. Their lives had been turned upside down by warfare, famine, disease, death, and economic chaos. Trade had been interrupted. Crops had been confiscated and destroyed. Cities had been laid waste. Many thousands of people had already been slaughtered or led away captives to a life of slavery. The people of Galilee were slaughtered. People tried to flee into the lake, and they were slain by the Romans, and the lake became red as blood. While the circumstances <coughs> between the second bodily coming and the day the flood swept the people away make sense, the comparison with the destruction of Jerusalem has its problems. Although, like I said, one could say it's just a very general warning against worldliness. That would, that would be the take I would take. If one does not twist the clear meaning of Scripture and impose the full preterist paradigm in the whole New Testament, then one will see radical differences between the coming of judgment on Israel and the second bodily coming. While Jesus gives his disciples several specific signs, and evangelicals falsely keep telling us 
from the 1800s to the present, actually from the 1700s to the present, even earlier, that Christ is coming next week because there's wars and there's rumors of wars and there's earthquakes and all these things, which happen all the time. Jesus was talking about things specific to the Middle East. <clears throat> um, so he, he says several specific signs regarding Jesus' destruction so all Christians can get out of town and escape the Roman armies. There are no specific signs related to the second bodily coming of Christ unless one assumes some kind of double fulfillment regarding the signs in Matthew 24, which exegetically is unsupportable and speculative. Now, I know there's a number of commentators look at Matthew 24 prior to verse 35 and say, well, it must be a double fulfillment. How can it be like lightning from the east to the west? Well, when you see some legions, several legions of the Roman armies come, it's going to go from the east of the horizon to the west of the horizon. And their, their uh, shields are going to glisten in the sunlight and sparkle. <clears throat> there are only very general, broad indicators regarding the second bodily advent. The gospel must spread throughout the earth. Matthew 13, 31 to 33, Isaiah 11, 9, etc. And achieve some kind of victory among the nations. Malachi 1, 11, Psalm 22, 23 to 28. Psalm 72, 8 to 11, Jeremiah 31, 34, etc. <clears throat> if one takes the Old Testament gospel victory passages literally, instead of as hyperbolic exaggerations, which is basically what all millennialists have to have to teach. Yeah, you don't take that stuff literally, it's just very hyperbolic. And people living a hundred years old, well, that's that's just say there's going to be blessings. Then one must expect whole nations, civil governments institutions, education centers, corporations, etc., to covenant with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and adopt an explicitly Christian law order. That is, a nation's civil laws are founded upon God's revealed moral laws, including the moral case laws. That would have to be widespread. That's what the prophets teach. Thus far, this has occurred only to an extent in a few European countries, for example, Scotland, all of which have broken their covenants and apostatized. And therefore, the Old Testament prophecies are not yet fulfilled. <clears throat> they certainly weren't fulfilled by AD 70. <clears throat> if postmillennialism is true, or even optimistic amillennialism, then one could logically conclude that the second coming is not near. It's not near. We've got a lot of things to see happen before, before it comes. A time will come when the Jews and Moss will turn to Christ, Romans 11, 11 to 26. Toward the end of the millennium, there must be a widespread apostasy and a return to social hatred and persecution of Christians, Revelation 27 and 9. That hasn't happened. That didn't happen by AD 70. There are some very specific indicators, but they are all essentially coterminous with the second bodily coming itself and therefore are not helpful in assessing how soon the second bodily coming will take place. All of Jesus' enemies are defeated, we are told. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 25. And that's referring, of course, to Psalm 110, verse 1 and following. All of the dead physical bodies of mankind, their dead actual bodies, both good and evil, will be resurrected from their graves. Daniel 12, 2. Matthew 5, 29 to 30. 10, 28. John 11, 25. Revelation 20, 13. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 54. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 to 16. The living saints are raptured to meet Jesus in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. And it means exactly what it says. They're going to meet Jesus in the atmosphere. When our Lord returns, death will be eliminated forever, and the whole body of Christ, the elect, the invisible church, the bride of Christ, will always be with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. In the renewed paradise of God, that is the recreated heaven and earth. Revelation 21, 1 and following, 22, 1 to 4. See Romans 8, 19 to 21, Acts 3, 21, Colossians 1, 20. The fact that there are no specific signs preceding the second bodily coming of Christ, like there were for his coming in judgment on Israel and Jerusalem, may be due to the fact <clears throat> in the coming of judgment that Jewish Christians needed to know when it was necessary to personally escape the armies of Rome. That's why he gives all these specific signs. I want you to be saved. I want you to escape. Once cities were encircled and besieged by Roman armies, it was virtually impossible to escape, especially for families. 
they would surround the whole city. They would make it, they, you couldn't get out. The, you know, their goal was to either dig under the walls or break down the gates or to sneak in another way or to starve the people to death. In addition, if the command to surrender was not immediately obeyed, which, which it was not in Jerusalem, it took the Romans a long time to destroy the city, the common practice was to slaughter all the inhabitants once the gates and walls were breached. And that explains the huge death toll in Jerusalem. Estimates go from a million and a half to two and a half million people were killed because people from the countryside would go behind the big city where they had nice big walls. <clears throat> Jesus' inclusion of many signs was designed to save the many Jewish believers and congregations. It was not so theological hacks could sell their eschatological fantasies in the 20th century and 21st century. And I'm talking about premillennialists who use Matthew 24. They ignore the context. They ignore it speaking about Israel and Jerusalem, and they all make it future. God placed Jerusalem under the ban, the cherim curse, because they were spiritual adulterers and murderers of the saints. The secondly bodily coming does not need signs to escape death and destruction because Christ himself personally delivers his people. That's the point of 1 Thessalonians, and that's the point of Revelation toward the end of Revelation 20. He comes in flaming fire with his mighty angels in order to take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 8. He personally delivers the saints. He doesn't tell them to hide. They don't have to sneak out of town and hide in the mountains. There are many important questions that our Lord's second bodily coming to judge all mankind, whether Christians or not, raises. Are you ready to, ready to meet the bridegroom? Are you ready? Are you living in a manner that is consistent with your Christian profession and biblical ethics? Are you faithfully following Jesus, or are you still in love with the world and the alluring but unlawful things of this world? Are you habitually obeying God's moral law and thus living in a manner that is covenantally faithful? It is useless to make a profession of love to the bridegroom unless there is loyalty, dedication, fidelity, and submission toward him. That's the point of eschatology. Let us not be weary, complacent, and lethargic, and thus fall asleep when we should be watching for our precious Lord's coming. In this evil world of unbelief and apostate Christianity, let us always be ready to meet the bridegroom. All unfruitful members of Christ's church will be condemned and cast in the lake of fire when Jesus returns and sits on his white throne of judgment. Christ is coming back, literally, bodily, to judge. A day of reckoning is coming. We will have to give an account for every covenant privilege given to us and every great biblical truth revealed to us. Let us therefore think about the second coming of Christ and the final judgment every single day. Think about it every morning. Think about it throughout the day. Think about it. Be willing to make sacrifices for your faith. Be willing to make sacrifices to serve Christ. For this is a certainty. It's coming. If it already happened A.D. 70... You know, what's the point of these parables? They become merely, well, I guess when you die, you're going to meet Jesus and he's going to judge you then. But if he came in AD 70, those parables don't even apply to us because he already came. Let us examine ourselves and judge our behavior in the light of God's holy word so that our works are not burned as useless stubble. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. Let us emphatically reject the heresy of full preterism, <coughs> which denies the bodily resurrection, the second bodily, literal coming of Christ, the renewal of planet Earth, the final public universal judgment, and the establishment of the perfect, glorious, consummate state. It teaches a reductionist, imperfect, insufficient doctrine of Christ's salvation. It's exegetically, theologically, and logically untenable yet it's growing in popularity. So be warned. But let us all meditate on the second coming. We don't live simply for the pleasures of today. We live to serve Christ because he's coming sometime tomorrow. 
we have to always be ready. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the coming of Christ. We thank you that he's coming again to judge the quick and the dead. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us a love of your holy law. Cause us to love your holy word. Cause us to bow the knee. Bend our hearts to submit to Christ in all things. That we would pick up our cross and follow him daily. That we would confess him publicly before men. That we would love him with all of our heart, mind, and soul. That he would be the first thing in every area of our life. Help us, Lord, for we have to fight that sinful flesh. Help us to hate sin and to love Christ more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.